On December 7th, 1972, the crew of Gene Cernan, Harrison Schmidt, and Ron Evans launched from Kennedy Space Center for the Apollo 17 mission. Yes, the final Apollo moon mission is now 50 years old. In 2014, a documentary called The Last Man on the Moon was released focusing on the life of the commander of that mission, Captain Eugene Cernan. And to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of that mission, a new version is being released. So we talked to one of the film's producers, Keith Haviland, to find out more. Are you doing anything to celebrate Apollo 17? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And like all podcasters say, please rate, review and subscribe wherever you can. But right now, enjoy episode 119 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 119 of the Space and Things podcast. Assuming all has gone well, Dave and I have now officially met in person, but we recorded (laughs) this a few weeks back before Dave left for America, but we still have a great episode for you. Yes, we do. The Last Man on the Moon documentary came out in 2014, and it's probably my favorite space documentary ever. So much so that I wrote a song inspired by it of the same name, which came out in 2018. The documentary focuses on the life of astronaut Gene Cernan, whose third and final space flight was commanding Apollo 17. And we are now currently in the 50th anniversary of that mission. To celebrate that, the makers of the documentary are releasing a new version, The Last Man on the Moon, Apollo 17. So we thought we'd talk to Keith Haviland, one of the documentary producers, to find out more. As well as The Last Man on the Moon, Keith has been involved in some other fantastic space documentaries, producing Mission Control, The Unsung Heroes of Apollo, and Armstrong. We understand that there are also some other space documentaries in the works from his company, Haviland Digital, So we're hoping to find out more about those too. Oh, a scoop. That would be nice. Anyway, let's get on with this interview. Contact. Push. Engine stop. Engine arm. Proceed. Command override off. Control add hold. Kings auto. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. All right. So welcome, Keith. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're, We're huge fans of your work. So before we get on to specific topics, tell us a bit about your background before you started working on spaceflight documentaries and and how did your background lead you into doing documentaries on spaceflight? Well, I mean, maybe the most important thing is the day that I was born. Because mm-hmm. I was born on the 1st of October, 1958. Oh, wow. And if you know your history, that's the day NASA started operating. So there was a kind of synergy already there. And when I was growing up, I mean, the 60s were the era of the space race, you know, great optimism about the future, dreams of go- going to the planets, the moon and the stars. So, you know, I've got a very clear memory of Apollo 11 landing when I was 10. It didn't stick to the time scale. So Buzz and Neil got out a little bit earlier. Uh-huh. So I wasn't awake. I was still asleep. <laughs> so I felt a bit miserable about that. But overall, what a fantastic time to be a kid. And so that was kind of where I started. I then had an academic career, a technology career, and I used to work for this gigantic company called Accenture, which is pretty close to three quarters of a million people these days. And I had a big technology job building capabilities across the world and using some of the technologies that were born out of Apollo. Mm. So the internet, microprocessors, the world we live in was very much a gift from those uh, developments of the space age and the space race. And then when I was at 40, I started getting back into space as a kind of hobby. And so I went to Space Fest, which was that fantastic thing in Tucson yeah. where we got to see lots of uh, Apollo astronauts and we could spend time in the bar and we could make friends with them. And there was one wonderful evening I was surrounded by the cast of 2001, 
<laughs> plus some of the cars from Battlestar Galactica, plus a handful of Apollo astronauts. And for a child of the 60s, so that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So I really enjoyed all of that. And then about eight years ago, I thought I should do something more creative because I've always wanted to be in film. And I'd already got to know Gene Cernan. He was a fantastically friendly human being, you know, and a, and a great friend of many people. I mean, Al Bean was similar, huge networks of personal contacts, and they took care to cultivate new and existing friendships. So I'd gotten to know Gene, and I met this film crew in London, and then we had dinner and a very early incarnation of something David called Soho House. Oh, yeah. Which is a rather nice club in London. They were doing this project. I helped them get it finished in a number of different ways. And I got Accenture involved as a kind of corporate sp sponsor around that as well. So we ended up showing the film uh, to Accenture customers as part of the rollout. And that was my first entree into filmmaking, working with the most wonderful subject in the world, perhaps, Gene Cernan himself. And he loved the film. We'll get onto that later, I guess. But that was my progression from being a child of the space race, living through a technology career, and then coming back to uh, spaces of interest uh, when I turned into a filmmaker. So The Last Man on the Moon was the first space documentary you were involved with? More or less. I mean, there's another little project uh, called In Saturn's Rings I helped sponsor a little bit before then. But the first thing I was really involved with and spent time on was The Last Man on the Moon. So what was your role within that movie then? Obviously, you said it as a bit of a corporate sponsor at first. So, so, so then I was an executive producer. Mm -hmm. And if you get a producer on a film, normally means somebody has helped raise money. So I helped raise some money to get it finished because it was a big budget production. Beyond that, though, I got involved with marketing. And so we got the film actually into Space Fest. And we had a premiere there, which was a very moving event. Uh, we used uh, my old company to bring it to a wider audience. Uh, I helped with the social media side and that kind of thing. So money initially, but also an active role in getting the thing understood and out there in the wider world, making sure that as many people as could could see the thing. So let's talk about the new version of The Last Man on the Moon, the Apollo 17 version. Uh, obviously, it makes a lot of sense with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17. Is this completely new or just slightly extended in places from the documentary that we loved? It's an evolution. It's a short film. And what we have started with is the original Apollo 17 sequence in the original film. And G went on three missions. So those are really well captured in the original. So you start with that extraordinary and dangerous spacewalk with Gemini 9, uh, which went badly wrong and taught the Americans that EVA was something dangerous and had to be really rehearsed. Uh, he obviously went very close to the moon on Apollo 10. And then with Apollo 17, he achieved his, his dream and commanded a mission and walked on the surface. And so the complexity of telling three mission stories means you have to treat each one differently. So one of the things we did in the new short film, just 23 minutes long, is tell the story of Apollo 17 in a very simple fashion. Yeah. So we made the launch sequence grander, we made it more vital, we added more sound effects, noise and music. So that comes across. We did ex extend it. So we cover the EVAs on the lunar surface more. I would tell the story of the broken fender. Oh, it's yeah. not the biggest disaster in space flight. But you know, Gene broke off the fender with his hammer, which was to get out of his pocket. That created this gigantic shower of moon dust, which made the rover more or less undrivable. And so miraculously, they managed, with the help of mission control, to put four map segments together and turn that into a kind of fender, which did, did a good job and kept protected them from a kind of shower of moon dust. So we cover that in a little detail. Obviously, we cover things like the orange soil. Mm -hmm. We've added a wonderful sequence involving Ron Evans. So Ron is one of the people 
we don't really know because he died quite young mm-hmm. as the commander of America, the command module that went around the moon. But there's a wonderful video online, and you can find it on YouTube, of him giving a presentation about 1980. Oh, so good. Have you seen that? Yeah, it's one of mine and Emily's favourite videos. We, <laughs> we often watch it. It's so good. It's fantastic because he's got this kind of 1970s comedian personality. He's a brilliant communicator. It's really funny. We couldn't use much of it because we've got a a narrative to fulfil, but we used 30 seconds of it. And we worked with the Evans family, God bless them, and they gave us the original tape from 1980. Nice. And we had it transferred at the highest quality we could. It's not tremendously high, but it's better than you get online. And so there's a sequence of him doing that speech interspersed with his actual spacewalk towards the end of the film. So nice. We wanted to do that and we got it in. And we've got a little bit more of Harrison and Smith, Jack Smith. And there is a speech sequence when they were speaking after the mission at an airbase about what they just achieved. And it's where Gene uses the phrase on the shoulders of giants. So we've got a bit more of, of Jack Smith as well. And then what we had, which I really wanted to be seen, and it hasn't been seen and will be seen now, what we had were Gene Cernan's words to the next Americans to walk on the moon. Oh, wow. So we recorded those eight years ago or 10 years ago, and we've intercut that with Artemis footage, but mostly animation. We didn't capture the uh, launch sequence of Artemis 1, but we have Artemis rollout and animation and some of the Artemis astronauts essentially communicating with Gene. So Gene is speaking to them. And so that's a wonderfully optimistic sequence. If you've seen the original, you know that Gene was a little bit pessimistic about where the space race had got to, what had happened to America's ambition. He would have been delighted with Artemis in terms of a bold goal, going back to the moon and planning to stay there. And so it's a nice finale to the whole last man experience. It's an optimistic ending about the future. And if you're a space nut, then you're going to love the fact that Gene is saying these words to the Artemis generation. Oh, I made hair stand up on the back of my neck just thinking about that. That was, uh, that sounds amazing. I'm sort of getting chills thinking about that because, yeah, he was talking about the younger people who weren't even alive yet. So that's really incredible. And it shows that space flight really is generational. So next question, obviously, Gene Cernan is an ideal candidate for a documentary. You know, he was the last man on the moon. But otherwise, you know, what made him a special, unique subject to profile uh, beyond the fact that obviously he's a historic figure? He had a big personality. I mean, he was literally a space cowboy, though he was born in Chicago, I think, or near Chicago. He had a ranch in Texas and he had cattle and all of that comes out in in the original film, and he was generous with his time. He really enjoyed going to things like Space Fest conferences, autograph shows, and communicating with people. I think communicating with kids in particular. He saw that as part of the mission of an astronaut, as many of them did and many of them do. And so he was a very open man. He had a way of speaking that was sometimes almost biblical. So one of the first conversations I had with him is where he used this famous phrase of his, you know, Keith, I was on God's front porch for three days. He'd often say that, and he could really bring to life his emotions, his feelings, his internal introspections as he's on the lunar surface, but he was telling people his experiences. So one of the questions an astronaut gets asked the most often is what did it feel like and gene is one of those astronauts who really did try to answer that question Uh, one of the things we found out in the film was that he was a fantastic lifelong friend of many people and one of the stars of the original last man was fred baldwin Mm. he's kind of wingman when he was an aviator in the army and that was accidental that was a discovery in a documentary, you often discover the best bits while shooting. And the fact that Baldy, Fred Baldwin, was such a great character and such a great friend of Gene's really came out 
in that shooting. So he's one of the stars of the film. And that wasn't planned. We'd expected it to obviously to be the astronauts and so on, but Fred was there as as one of the big voices about Gene's life. Does that happen a lot when you're making documentaries that the story might go somewhere else? I mean, they often say a documentary is discovered in the edit, and that's yeah. true. And so you'd film it, you end up with like 48 hours of interviews, and there's a character that shines in a way you didn't expect. Mm. We made another film about mission control, and the character that, to my mind, really shone above the ones you'd expect uh, was Bob Carlton. Yeah. So Bob Carlton, as you probably know, was the guy with the stopwatch working out how quickly they were running out of fuel as Apollo 11 was descending. And in the flesh, towards the end of his life, he was, he was a quiet, gentle human, but on the screen he kind of shone with an inner light. And his storytelling was wonderful. So to me, that's one of the strengths of, of that particular project, Bob's discussion discussion of, of, of the last steps of the Apollo 11 landing. Uh, I completely agree with that. Um, so b- before we move on to, to your other projects, have you got any stories about Gene from when you were releasing The Last Man on the Moon? In the documentary, there's some really funny moments and some very poignant ones as well. So any highlights from the time you spent with him during that process? It's, I mean, it's hard to tell. Oh, yes. Okay, I've got two. Okay. So one is a tiny thing. He took a particular dislike to some blue trainers I had, like bright blue <laughs> trainers, and he, he didn't forgive me whenever I wore them. Um, so it was always a pointed, pointed remark. And that was in South by Southwest in Austin when we were showing the film there. But we opened the film at Sheffield Dock Fest. Yeah. So that's a well-known, important documentary festival in the north of England. And we presented the film, Packed House, Audience loved it. Audience starts walking out of the cinema at the end of the film as the credits roll. Gene gets up, and they didn't know Gene was there. No way. And so the audience suddenly goes, oh, my God. In fact, there were more expletives than that. But, oh, my God, he's here. And they all rush back in and listen to this man they just weren't expecting to meet, weren't expecting him to have made the trip to Sheffield. So that was kind of magical. Then after that, and this is the thing I was trying to get to, we took Gene to a Yorkshire pub. Oh, nice. And they had specially made Spaceman Ale. So they had a <laughs> pump with Spaceman Ale on it. And we put Gene into a silly jester hat you know, with, with bangles and bells hanging down, and he started pulling pints behind the bar. Amazing. You wouldn't expect to see Gene Sterling doing that, but he did it with enormous grace and good humour. I love that story about that premiere because to me that the opening scene of the documentary where he's he's sitting in the in the rodeo yeah and he's sitting next to people who aren't aware or, or the way it appears in the documentary but it, is that they're not aware of the historical significance of this this man sitting next to them and and the stories and obviously the juxtaposition with the images from his past and the things he's achieved it's such a beautiful opening to the documentary uh so so knowing that actually that also almost was mirrored in the premiere at, at, in sheffield is quite something i mean there's a related story about neil armstrong i mean neil was never a recluse but he didn't like celebrity mm. and he was once playing golf and a man came up to him and went do you know you look just like Neil Armstrong? Has anybody ever told you that? And Neil went, no, no, nobody's ever mentioned that. And carried on playing golf. That's hysterical. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So after The Last Man on the Moon was made, you set up Haviland Digital, and you've gone on to make some of our favorite space documentaries, including the one you mentioned a few minutes ago, Mission Control, The Unsung Heroes of Apollo, and Armstrong, who who you just mentioned. How hands-on have you been with these documentaries? So, so, so Mission Control Armstrong, I was pretty much hands-on. So, you know, I was I was one of the two main producers on Mission Control, and so we toured the US and we met these most extraordinary people. Now, given my background in Accenture and technology, the thing that I really wanted to make a film about were were teams. Mm. And Mission Control is about this group of men, because in those days, with one or two exceptions, it was men. It was that era. But this group of people had come together to do something. 
they'd often come from really ordinary backgrounds in terms of you know, being a sergeant in the military or having a degree in marketing from a minor college. So these were not necessarily the best ac academic pool, but some of them were brilliant in that sense. But you know, men with experience from the military, from aviation, from different aspects of life. So these people got together from their ordinary backgrounds and collectively they all became extraordinary. And they did this extraordinary thing that worked with one or two really notable exceptions more or less perfectly over you know, essentially a six or seven year period. And I find that remarkable how they went from you know, the famous 15 minutes of space flight when mm. Kennedy made his promise to actually achieving it before the decade is out as a con continuous project of energy and momentum and focus that exhausted some of them you know, for the whole of the 70s. But what a moment in history. And they did that as a team. And even today, they kind of connect as a team and they give each other the respect of a fellowship or a partnership. And I think that's a wonderful story to tell. And it was such a pleasure to meet these great figures from American and world history and get to know them a little. So it was just an absolute joy end to end. And I think I managed to attend and be part of every interview during that particular project. Wow. And it was just a, a wonderful thing to be part of. And of course, we were working with uh, Rick Houston. Yeah. Who's one of your favourite authors. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody you mentioned in a previous uh, podcast when you were talking about the book prizes. Mm-hmm. So Rick's book was was the key inspiration for that film. Yeah, it's a great book. We've we've had him on as well. He's a he's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful guy. Actually, his podcast is what inspired us to do our podcast. Did really? Well, that's fantastic. It's all connected. It it's all connected. Yeah. One of my favorite moments in the Armstrong movie is the Chris Craft interview. I thought he was wonderful in that. There's almost a, a moment where he reveals, and it may or may have not been true, but he reveals that he's the reason why Neil walked on the moon first and not Buzz. It's such a wonderful thing. The expression in his face as he says it is, is one of those amazing moments. Were you there for that moment or was that something you saw afterwards and you just thought, oh, wow, that's that's quite a moment, the way he delivered that line? I think, I mean, I mean I've, I've been in several interviews with Chris. I think I was there, but Chris was somebody we really got on with well. Mm. He liked us as a team. Gareth, you know Gareth Dodds, our producer? No. One of the things that Gareth did for Chris was fix his TV. <laughs> so we went around there, Chris's TV wasn't working. We were film guys, so he assumed we could fix the TV. And I think Gareth managed to do it. So he loved <laughs> us for that. But my God, he, at the end of his life, he would speak his mind without fear or favour. He was very direct. Yeah. And one of my favourite sequences is that it's a very moving sequence is when he talks about the Apollo 1 fire mm. in the Mission Control film. Yeah. And he does that with such anger at himself and at NASA for letting those three men die because it was such an avoidable accident. And he blazes with accountability when he does that. And it's a, a really impressive sequence. So he was, he was a great favourite of ours. Absolutely. Um, we've had a question come in from one of our Patreon subscribers, Don Irwin. He said... We space enthusiasts can be uh, pedantic when it comes to accuracy and stories about our space history. Are there times when you had to omit or change a story to appeal maybe to a broader audience? It's a good question. I might need a few seconds to think about it. I mean, you know, there, there are people who, who insist on complete accuracy. And one of the famous things that is very hard to get right is using archive that's exactly contemporaneous with the event, because it just doesn't exist. You know, not yeah. everything was filmed all the time. And so to tell a story, you generally have to use archive from different missions to build the story. And I think that's fine, as long as you're clear about what you're doing. And I think a, a kind of example of, of that being done properly, actually, is the great movie Apollo 13 yeah, with Tom Hanks, because the people who made the film spent, as you will probably know, a lot of time with the mission control team the, and the astronauts understanding the story. And then they made some great economies of storytelling. So the Gene Kranz character, played by Ed Harris, represents the work of four flight directors. 
And so that was a very deliberate move to make the film digestible to an audience. And the four people concerned understand why that was done and kind of approve of it. And one of the great and nice things for us about making the Mission Control documentary, uh, we were able to tell the story of those four people in a much more comprehensive way. And I have to say that meeting Lynn Lally was an enormous pleasure. I mean, he was such a generous man with his time. He had this inner calmness that must have been invaluable in the heat of the Apollo 13 events themselves. And he was one of the people who really worked out the strategy by which those men were brought home. So he had a lot of thinking as they were micromanaging the health of the spacecraft. Mm. And so collectively, those four flight directors and their various shifts really did team. And you know, that's part of the story we wanted to tell. And we at least get some of it across, I think. We, we begin to give that sense of a team working in such harmony. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, we've discussed the, the, the new edition of Last Man on the Moon. Where, where will people be able to see that, by the way? So, so we want it as part of the celebrations. And so it will premiere in Houston at the Space Centre as part of their celebrations. And I think the opening night is the 16th of December. Right. And then they will show it for at least a year in their cinemas. And putting it there was like our main focus. We we love working with, with Space Centre Houston. We wanted it to be shown there. Uh, there's one other major uh, institution, which I probably shouldn't mention because they haven't yet announced it, but they might be based in Florida. <laughs> um, who will show it? Um, and there'll be another uh, number of others around the US. In the UK, uh, the National Space Centre in Leicester has a celebratory event, and they're going to have some previews of the film there. So that would be a kind of UK base. And then later on, once we've got through those celebrations, we're hoping to get it on more widely available streaming platforms. That's good to know that people will be able to see that. So, uh, apart from that, are there any other space documentaries that you might have in the pipeline? And can you tell us a bit about them? I mean, the three in development. Yeah. Because they're in development. I mean, development of a film is a fragile thing. You're trying to get a, a chrysalis to create a butterfly. And so you probably shouldn't give too much away. But I can tell you some some aspects of, about the projects. Because I, think, I think they will all come off mm -hmm. one way or the other. Uh, so one is working with a director called Robert Stone. So I worked with Robert Stone for Chasing the Moon, which was a big PBS flagship um, in 2019, commemorating the moon landing of Apollo 11. And Chasing the Moon is just simply a wonderful piece of work because he has so much breadth. Yeah, It tells stories about the astronauts and the social context and the people who didn't become astronauts in a way which is compelling. So I love what Robert did. He's a really good... Uh, director and he and i'm supporting him in this as a producer he is creating a project about the interplanetary missions cool and the expansion of human knowledge of the planets in the solar system and beyond across the last 50 years it's something i wanted to do personally for a long time and i'm delighted that robert is doing it and it could be extraordinary because the breadth of the story is amazing. In the end, you come back to the central point is every planet we've, we found is going to be very hard to live on. And so the importance of looking after planet Earth is just stressed. I mean, the overall, overall effect is amplified the more that we know about the universe. So that'll be one of the main themes, I'm sure, that comes out of it. So that's a wonderful project then we have started work with a very significant female shuttle astronaut. And that's something that I've always wanted to do as well. Because uh, I think the, the story of women achieving as much of men in the armed services and in space flight is one that must be told. Mm -hmm. I think the Mercury 13 a few years ago started telling it but we've got the opportunity to talk about somebody's achieved a lot over her career. 
and it was a very active project. We're looking for a director. I'm working with some really strong producers in the UK. I've got the support of people in the US. We started a gathering archive. So it's got a certain amount of momentum, but it's too early to be explicit. Yeah. I mean, you won't be you won't be surprised. You can almost certainly start guessing very <laughs> soon. But that's something again I'm very excited about. And the other thing that started happening uh recently is with director Mark Craig. Yeah. Mark did the Last Man on the Moon original version. He's also for me created the short version. As he was making Last Man on the Moon, he encountered the story of the Apollo One fire. And there's a very, very moving sequence with Martha Chaffee mm. in that film when she talks about having to sell her children the news of that terrible event. And it's a remarkable sequence. And she does it with with um, a great deal of bravery as well as emotion. And so what Mark is now getting support from, from a European broadcaster, is making a film that's a, a kind of the definitive study of Apollo 1, trying to bring to life the three men uh, and telling the, the story of the aftermath and the significance in terms of human impact and impact on the programme. And as you know, a lot of people see it as a foundational event in the history of spaceflight, was it what forced NASA to really get their act together in terms of technology. You know, we have to do that with a great deal of sensitivity and care. Uh, so I don't want to say much more than I've said. And that's probably earlier in its life cycle than the other two projects. But it's something I think has more chance of happening than it ever had. So yeah. that would be a great project for Mark to do. So fingers crossed on that one. But as you can see, I mean, there are three very substantial projects. So it's the other one, it would be fantastic. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Obviously, as you mentioned, uh, with the Apollo 1 coverage within The Last Man of the Moon, you have that amazing interview with, with Martha, and you said that you, there's also the uh, amazing interview with Chris Craft about that, and we see other people in those documentaries get emotional about what happened and, and looking back on that. Obviously, since you started making these documentaries, the, the other tragic thing is that we're losing these people, right? Uh, the, the people that were there, the people that can tell those stories. So when when you now are making something new that talks about that? Will you be using the interviews you've already done or do you not make that decision until you're in the making it? So, 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 so there'll be some important things being done early next year as part of the process to make sure we have new material that can really fit into uh, the storytelling. And so we're making sure that we invest in that process early as we mm -hmm. build the overall structure for the film. There's archive stuff that exists and we could use that and we have a lot of it ourselves, but it's always best to ask questions of people that are particularly related to the project in hand. So certainly we'll do some of that. Absolutely. Personally, I, when I look at the documentaries you've made so far and the time you've been doing it, I think that we are extremely lucky that you've been doing it. For the reason I just said, you know, look at the cast of The Last Man on the Moon. We've lost so many of them already. To be able to have those stories, to be able to have the cheeky moments with Dick Gordon on the screen, to have those Alan Bean moments on the screen, and for them to have that moment to tell their stories, it's been amazing. So uh, this is just a little bit of me at the end saying thanks for doing it, really, and 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 because they've been I, almost like that that documentary in particular was almost life changing for me to watch i was so much as of of what has come after after that documentary came out for me has been because i was so inspired by that documentary and the people that are in it well fantastic i mean it's so i will take the thank you but i'm going to take it on behalf of course of the team of people yeah so mark craig i think took 7 years to get his idea of making a film about Gene Cernan from conception to being on the screen. And it took him quite a, a length of time to convince Gene. Mm. And actually the story that I've been told is that the person who convinced Gene to do it was a young man called Harrison Ford, <laughs> who said, no, you should make it, Gene, because it's not about you. It's a story about how somebody can come from a humble background 
and through hard work and perseverance, achieve something wonderful. And that was the trigger for Gene beginning to say yes to the project. So, I mean, that's quite a remarkable thing in itself. Um, so Mark Craig, supported by Mark Stewart, supported by Gareth Dodds, who was you know, the, the key producer of several of those films, he, uh, are very much part of the set of people who have made these happen. And I've been a catalyst, but you know, I'm, I'm one of a group of people who have made this. And I think it's been a pleasure and a privilege for us to be able to tell, uh, to get the astronauts and the people who were in mission control to tell their stories. Mm. So in, in a way, we're just turning on a tap to knowledge that exists and getting these wonderful people onto a screen. But I mean, I've really enjoyed doing it. I'm really glad to hear that the two of you do as well. Absolutely. I think one of the first episodes we did two and a half years ago was called Our Favourite Space Documentaries, and it was pretty much all of your work. So uh, yes. <laughs> that's uh, it's always nice to, to meet someone who's, who's actually been part of that as well. So thanks very much for joining us, Keith. This is uh, it's been really interesting, really insightful, and obviously we wish you all the best with the uh, with the upcoming projects, and especially the, the Apollo 17 one. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to catch up soon as well. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope you continue to do these podcasts i mean they're, they're interesting and they're wonderful things to do it's part of the communication that we've achieved by the film you're doing the same thing in a different different medium so congratulations and good luck thank you very much thank you i was rolling on the moon one day in a merry merry month of december now may 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 the month. may that's right may is the year of the month I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I, I know we've talked on a previous podcast episode about um, Last Man on the Moon and it being amongst our, our some of our favorite documentaries about space flight. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, initially, before watching it, I was kind of nervous because I'm like, is it just going to show him as like this hero? You know, and what I loved about him is it showed him as sort of this fallible person. He admits freely, Cernan admits freely in the movie, you know, I wasn't a great father all the time. I wasn't a great husband, you know, and my career really did take a toll on my relationships. And he's very open about it. Not everybody is like that. You know, some people will not admit, yeah, my lifestyle messed up my relationship. So I just loved it. I, I and I'm looking forward to all the other projects as well, especially uh, I know he couldn't mention any names. The the woman shuttle astronaut one. I don't know who that is about, but I'm really looking forward to hearing that because it's about time our story gets told. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I said it within the interview, that, but Last Man on the Moon documentary really, in many ways, has changed my life. That may sound a bit over the top and dramatic, but probably isn't. You know, I, d I doubt me and you would be doing this right now if it wasn't for that documentary. Absolutely not. I, I I can't speak for other people, but it, it definitely inspired me because it was just, I, I just thought it was beautifully and brilliantly yeah. done. The Mission Control movie as well. I mean, they're just essential viewing, in my opinion, absolutely essential viewing. And, and, and I really think it's true that we're lucky that they made those documentaries at the point they did you know because we've lost so many of the people that were involved in those documentaries since they came out and we've got some incredible stories and some inspiring stories from them and as you know of course any documentary or, or especially things like this there is of course a bias it is trying to sell you the apollo program or or there's an element of that. But as you said, that they're, they're also trying to show the human side of these people and, and the, some of the mistakes and, and their regrets. And, and they're not just painting them all as supermen. You know, they're painting them as humans. Yeah. I love how he brought up the fact that it's showing they're from humble backgrounds. I think that's one of the things I love about the documentaries is you see yeah. their backgrounds, where they're from, and the, the images of the farmyards and the romantic shots of these small towns in the middle of nowhere, like the town where John Aaron is from and things like that. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah. They didn't grow up with an enormous amount of like privilege. You know, they weren't like these very upper class guys. A lot of them came from very like regular backgrounds, you know, where they had parents who were working class and they, and they ended up working on, it's one of the most incredible programs of all time. Absolutely. 
yeah, I love the human elements that are that are put it in the Haviland documentaries because uh feel like with Apollo especially it's very easy to get and I'm gonna probably get torn up on social media for saying this very like rah rah USA we went to the moon first and everybody can suck it <laughs> you know it's very easy I think for people to get into that frame of mind like and I feel like these documentaries really attach like people you know human human faces to what actually happened yeah there was that element of okay we got to beat the soviets but there was also this element of we're going to do something that nobody's ever done and it's not just for the united states we got to do something bigger than ourselves and we're going to succeed in it if that makes any sense so i love how they deal with that it's not a super bowl ad uh, as much as i like football i'll talk I think about find that a super bowl today, is not football but- Still, it's not like that. It's something where people can be, okay, this is, these are regular people who just had extraordinary, who ended up growing into these extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. There's another reason why these are really important. Obviously, we spend a lot of time, Emily, talking about books we love, especially the space books we love. We love a book. A lot of people in this day and age don't have time to read all the books that we do. I mean, I've got books I haven't read that are up on that shelf that I'm need to get round to. So I don't even have time to read all the books that I would like to read, but I try my very best. A documentary that's an hour to an hour and a half long has the chance to probably reach so much more than a book is. I've got the book Last Man on the Moon. It's good. It's nowhere near as good as the documentary. I've got Rick Houston's book, which I love. I think it's one of the best books out yes. there about mission control and what was going on behind the scenes. But the documentary is next level. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the book. The book actually in- it inspired it. So you need the book. Of course you do. And I recommend it to anyone. Yeah. But that documentary is so, 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 so good. Like you said, they both sort of inter- interchange with each other. Like, you, you know, you should look at both, but the documentary is incredible. I think as well, because you're looking in the faces of the people as they're telling you the stories makes it have a little bit more impact than when you're reading the page and there's another name mentioned and it's them telling the story and you have to flick through to find the photos so you go, oh, it's that guy talking and and so on and so forth. As a documentary, they're right there. And then you have all the other visuals which help you connect with those people. So in many ways, it's easier for a documentary to connect, but they've done it so, so very well. Uh, and as I keep saying, we're very lucky to have these these pieces of work to share with yeah. people. And I, you know, I've used them myself to to say, "Hey, look, you're wondering why I'm into this stuff. Watch this. Let's sit down with me and watch this. We can pause it if you've exactly. got questions, but just enjoy it. Enjoy being with these people and hearing their stories." Exactly. And I'll say this one thing before I, I finish, especially the Mission Control movie. It's mostly, you know, in the movie these old men in mission control and they look, you know, and for somebody who doesn't know who they are, you know, not a space enthusiast like we are, you know, you're just going to say, Oh, it's just a bunch of old guys, you know? And when they open their mouths and they reveal what they did, you're like, okay, these are the biggest badasses alive. And I love that stuff. I just love it. A few weeks ago, I went to Jerry Carr's tree ceremony in Houston and, you know, a lot of the guys from Apollo showed up and they're all in their 80s and 90s now. I'm looking at all the guests there and, you know, there's Fred Hayes and I'm like, Fred, oh, you know, he just looks like this little unassuming grandfather, you know, and very modest, doesn't announce himself. And this guy is one of the biggest badasses on this planet. I mean, flew Enterprise, survived Apollo 13. I just love the idea of giving these guys this platform because I feel like that entire generation was just built differently. They just were. I don't know. I'll stop now. I could go on about this forever. I think you might be right. There's one other side of this as well. When I was over in America for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, I was at Space Center Houston and I see one of these little old men and I knew who it was because of the documentary. And I was able to go and say hello to Bill Moon and thank him for what he did. I doubt I would have known that he was someone that worked in Mission Control. He would have just been someone else in the museum if it wasn't for the fact I'd seen that documentary. And I think some of these guys have now got a bit of fame in their old age because of this documentary. And I think that's wonderful. I think it's amazing. They deserve it. That is. Especially Bill. He is like the sweetest guy ever. 
He he's been at Space Fest, I think, a couple times, and he was just awesome. He was somebody who'd worked on everything, and it, it's just yeah, it's nice to see him getting a measure of stardom from this because he deserves it. Because a lot of those guys really did. They flew under the radar. You didn't hear about them. They weren't yeah. stars. You know, a lot of the astronauts were stars, but they weren't. And it's cool to see them, like you said, in their in their. I don't want to say later years because I'm hoping they all outlive me. But the expression I like to use is in the autumn of their years. I think that's what Frank Sinatra sang anyway. Yeah, it's nice to see them, you know, at this phase of their life, getting that kind of recognition. I think it's a little late, yeah. but still getting that kind of public accolade that, hey, we did something collectively that is almost, I wouldn't say impossible, but that was just incredible. We're still working towards doing it again, and it's over 50 years later. Absolutely. So as always, uh, the full interview is up on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. And don't forget, anyone who's involved in our Patreon can submit questions to our guests. Last few weeks, Don Owen has been doing us a, a real solid one and providing some amazing questions. So thank you, Don. Uh, anyone else on there, don't forget that you can also participate in that. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. It doesn't feel right to do a things that caught our eye this week section when we're recording this a few weeks early, so we're going to wrap it up here this week. We've got one more pre-recorded show next week while Dave continues his travels. Hopefully those on Patreon are getting all the extras at the moment as he shares his story. Yep, I'm doing my best to post things over there. Uh, that's my intention anyway. So please check it out on patreon.com forward slash space and things. Thanks to all for listening. And please, please, please consider sharing the podcast to those who you think might like it. But right now, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.